Hello, I'm Dami Coker, and welcome to this Airy Scientific Beta webinar. Today, we are going to be providing a critical analysis of bottom-up multi-factor portfolio construction. Joining me is Eric Shabini, who is Global Research and Investment Solutions Director at Airy Scientific Beta. Hello, Eric. Hi, Dami. So, we previously covered um, bottom-up versus top-down approaches in a separate webinar, which was presented by Felix Goltz, who is Research Director with Scientific Beta. But today, Eric will be giving us a deeper look into the construction of bottom-up portfolios, and he'll be providing some critical insights. So please follow the materials we will be sharing with you on screen. If you have a question, do send it to us through your webinar interface or to webinar at scientificbeta.com, and we'll get back to you in due course. Okay, so let's begin by moving on to our introductory slide. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dami. So this is, if you like, um, a quite a one-sided uh, point of view of uh, bottom-up approaches. Scientific Beta uses a top-down approach to build multi-factor portfolios for good reason. And what we would like to do today is outline the reasons um, behind uh, the use of a top-down um, approach. Okay. So just by way of uh, introduction, there's been uh, increasing investor interest in uh, multi-factor portfolio solutions. Um, but product providers recently, as Danny has po uh, Dami has pointed out, have really been debating the respective benefits of the top-down and bottom-up approaches uh, to constructing multi-factor portfolios. So the top-down approach um, essentially builds single-factor portfolios, fa factors that have a long uh, term, uh, well, that are well rewarded over the long term, and blends those single-factor portfolios together to improve um, risk-adjusted portfolios. That is the top-down approach um, through single-factor portfolios. Now, in contrast, bottom-up approaches um, construct portfolios um, through stock level exposures and through stock level exposures proponents of the bottom-up approach claim they have much more flexibility in constructing multi-factor portfolios and can construct portfolios with much higher factor exposure and that higher factor exposure leads to higher returns. Um, so that's the case that is being put forward by proponents of the bottom-up approach. But against this uh, backdrop, we contrast the claims of the proponents of bottom-up approaches with the relevant findings in the academic literature because, in fact, some of the claims being made actually go completely against what we know from um, the academic literature on factor investing. So what we would like to do today is present to you the case why bottom-up approaches are not necessarily the best way to um, approach multi-factor portfolio construction. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, now let's go into a bit more detail. So we know that bottom-up approaches use stock-level information or stock-level data. So my first question is, um, does it make sense to account for fine-grained differences in factor exposures? Okay, so yes, that's the, uh, that's the first uh, topic that we really want to address. And we have um, four different uh, parts of this question that we want uh, to go into a little bit more detail about. So the first uh, point is that, that, that I would like to make and present the academic evidence for is that stock level estimates are not reliable. So the underlying assumption behind the bottom-up approach is that the factor scores at the individual stock level are somehow proportional to the expected returns. Now, the first thing that we know um, from the academic literature is it is very difficult to estimate expected returns over even long-term time horizons because the expected returns at stock level are very, very noisy. And there are classic studies um, on this uh, 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 on this point by Merton going back to 1970 and of course by Fisher Black in 1993. Um, so stock returns um, are very difficult to estimate and doing that via uh, factor exposures therefore leads to a lot of noise. Furthermore, it's not just the noise but in fact there is even evidence to suggest that there isn't a direct relationship between factor exposures and expected stock returns. So there is a study by Cedarberg and uh, O'Doherty, that's the most recent study published in 2015, where they show that there is no deterministic link um, between factor scores and stock returns. In fact, it's anything but linear. 
There is another study, a recent study by uh, Patton and uh, Timmerman, that actually show that um, the relationship isn't one-to-one, -one, and in fact it isn't uh, monotonous. So just because you have higher factor exposure doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, higher returns. Just because you have low factor exposure doesn't mean you have lower factor returns. It can actually vary quite a lot as you go through the different spectrum of um, value exposures. So using stock level data, there is clearly academic evidence that there isn't a direct relationship between the factor scores and expected um, returns. And that is why, when you look at academic studies on factor investing, what academics do is they create a portfolio um, of stocks. So they typically rank all the stocks by a factor characteristics, a simple parsimonious factor characteristics, and they identify a group of stocks. It is very difficult to differentiate between individual stocks, so the idea is to create a portfolio, a well-diversified portfolio, that enables you to capture the premium related to that factor in, efficient, in an efficient manner. So that is a, an important and first point. The second point is that what has been documented in the academic literature at the single factor level tends to break down if you start to look at multi-factor scores at the stock level. So there is a, a study here that we, uh, uh, we reproduce one of the tables from the study here um, that shows the interaction and uh, the interaction between value and momentum. So uh, going down that table, um, we have uh, different levels of momentum. And as we go right across the table, um, that's different uh, levels of value exposure. Um, so if we look to, uh, at the column Q5 minus Q1, the second column from the end, um, and we look to see what the return is, so these are the returns of the value portfolio across different momentum segments, you can see that the value premium is very different and there is no consistency at all um, between the different segments of the momentum portfolio. So the underlying assumption when you start to combine signals at stock level is that there is somehow a direct relationship between the two. That clearly is not the case um, when we look at that table. So that is another second point, is that these single factor relations that have been documented on single factor level, if you look at them at multi-factor level, stock level, they break down. And there are also examples, similar examples for the low volatility um, factor. Thirdly, um, we also have uh, another approach that is used um, where uh, a lot of people use a kind of a mean variance approaches. So they take a composite factor score, again, at stock level, and they use that as a proxy for expected return in an optimization process. And the idea with this optimization process is to um, maximize risk-adjusted or relative risk-adjusted return. So the proxy here that is being used, the multi-factor score, is being used as a proxy for expected return as an input uh, um, to the optimizer. But the problem is that that expected return at stock level is very, very noisy. And when you put a noisy signal through an optimizer, it's been well documented and we point to one of the studies here, it leads to error maximization. So the stock that has the highest error, that may have the highest, that may have the highest score, and that score may be due to some kind of error at stock level, that will get exaggerated in an optimizer. Um, and then what ends up happening is you tend to be concentrated in the stocks with the highest errors, error maximization. Now this is a very well known problem in portfolio construction, and there are techniques to get around that um, by using constraints um, at the portfolio level, so the idea is that you don't put too much weight on any individual stock, so you limit the level of errors. Well, the problem with that is it then leads to model mining. Well, at what level do you set those constraints? Typically what people do is they do a backtest to work out how they should set that constraint, and then clearly what you're doing is you're subjecting yourself to data and model mining, and that may not be robust uh, out of samples. And the third issue with this kind of approach as well is it leads to highly concentrated solutions because you really do, fact, you really do favor the factor champions, the ones that have got a good score, because what you're suggesting is that they will have 
have the highest expected, expected return. So if you typically look at these kind of approaches, um, they are very, very concentrated portfolios. In many cases, they're even more concentrated than the cap-weighted index itself. So again, an issue of using stock level estimates. And last, really, to wrap up this point, is that this stock level approach really goes against the academic foundations of um, factor investing. If we look at how academics um, analyze uh, factors, typically what they do is they identify standalone portfolios, so sorting stocks on a criteria and creating long and short portfolios for each separate factor. And the idea of um, uh, multiple, of having multiple factors is that a properly specified multi-factor model will ensure you don't have too much correlation, in other words, too much overlap between the factors. And that is typically also how factors are identified as being independent sources of risk and return through single independent um, sorts. So that is typically um, how factor investing is conducted, is conducted at the single portfolio level. And therefore, it makes sense that when you do invest in a multi-factor world, that you replicate this kind of approach in terms of creating port single factor portfolios that are exposed to the factor in a similar kind of way. The portfolio approach also, uh, the reason it's also being used in academia is that um, it creates a well-diversified portfolio. We don't know precisely what that factor is. Um, we tend to use parsimonious, simple definitions because we don't know precisely what that factor definition is, but then the idea is to try to diversify away um, stock risk. So this is another important point of creating single factor portfolios. It allows you broad diversification um, because we don't know what precisely what that underlying factor is. So we use parsimonious definitions combined with diversification. Those are the foundations of um, factor investing. Okay, thanks Eric. So just to summarize, uh, I believe you made four points there. So what you're saying is firstly that the academic literature says that the stock level estimates are not reliable. Exactly. Secondly, the single factor relations um, break down at the multi-factor level. And then you mentioned that the mean variance optimization approaches tend to lead to error maximization and concentration. Concentration, yep. Okay. And finally, that the, uh, the academic literature on factor investing is based on creating single factor portfolios in a top-down manner. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, now, I understand you wanted to say something about um, the overstating of back-tested performance. So, can you expand on that? Could, could the back-tested performance of bottom-up approaches be overstated? Yes, this is, um, this is another um, very important point. Mm -hmm. um, so, the point really being made here is that um, when you use stock level data, mm -hmm. then um, what proponents of this bottom-up um, approach claim is you have many more degrees of freedom and therefore it allows you a great deal more flexibility um, to construct multi-factor um, portfolios. But that statement really m is making um, an underlying assumption that, um, that that relationship stays stable through time. So when you look at that uh, relationship at stock level, you're assuming that it's going to be relevant over the next period and the period um, after that. So in this uh, slide here, we actually show you the stability of um, the relationship at stock level. In other words, um, when you construct a multi-factor score and we look at that correlation through time, how stable is that um, multi-factor score? And what we clearly show here, the correlations are well below one um, and therefore are not stable um, through time. Furthermore, um, this idea of having a more flexible approach at stock level um, also leads to the possibility of data mining. Um, so the idea is if you have more and more stocks and more and more degrees of freedom, um, you have, it clearly opens up the door uh, to the potential of, um, of data mining. Um, so an important point that is made in academic studies is you need to be able to adjust um, also for the multiple testing hypothesis um, uh, as well because you have multiple, uh, because you have a large number of degrees of freedom. So you want to be able to adjust for finding a result simply by fluke.
And when you actually make those adjustments, um, there is a study here by Leopold and, and Roig um, that actually show that once you make an adjustment for the multiple testing, that there is no superiority of bottom-up approaches compared to top-down approaches. Okay, so there's no superior superiority. So um, what you're saying is that the performances of bottom-up approaches are overstated uh, because the stock level characteristics are unstable, and actually that might lead to uh, model mining risks. Exactly. Okay. And finally, I believe um, you wanted to say something about the overweighting of uh, stock champions in the bottom-up approaches. Um, so I guess the question would be, what what is the cost of pursuing factor champions rather than diversification? Yeah, this is um, uh, another important point, and it's a point that I alluded uh, to earlier, is that um, the stock level approach uh, tends to identify champions, the ones that have got a positive exposure to all the stocks, mm -hmm. and that tends to lead to portfolio concentration, whereas the evidence in the academic literature is to try to identify a well-diversified portfolio because that tends to give you a higher risk-adjusted return. Okay. Um, so this is ta this table here is actually taken from a study um, that you refer that Dami referred to um, earlier about a comparison of the bottom-up and top-down um, uh, uh, approaches. So what we've done here is we have identified a group of stocks that have got the highest multi-factor multi exposure. Um, and we've, uh, we've identified 50% from the universe and also 20% from the universe. Now, the idea with the bottom-up approaches is they take this universe, this 50% universe, and they try to overweight and underweight securities according to the score, the score-weighted SCW, the score-weighted approach. If, however, you discard the score altogether, and you simply diversify your portfolio, what we see in this table here, it leads to actually similar sharp ratios, but it leads to much higher information ratios. You actually get higher risk-adjusted returns by having a well-diversified portfolio than trying to identify individual differences between stocks. Furthermore, we can also see that this score-weighted approach, because it's so unstable, um, also leads to higher levels of turnover. Diversification is key when it comes to factor investing. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all the time we have before taking questions, so thank you for that, Eric. Um, but before we finish, can you just summarize the principal uh, reasons for your skeptical view on bottom-up approaches then? Yeah, sure. So. Um, to conclude, really, there, were, there, there are three main elements to really think about when investing in multi-factor portfolios using a bottom-up approach. First of all, using stock-level signals and assuming that there is a deterministic link between stock returns and factor exposures is inconsistent with the academic evidence on asset pricing, firstly. Secondly, the more stock level data you have, the more degrees of freedom you think you have, leads to more and more data mining. You need to adjust for the degrees of freedom. When you do that, there is no evidence that bottom-up approaches are superior to top-down approaches. And finally, we also looked at um, the kind of mean variance and heuristic approaches, the score-weighted um, approaches, and what those approaches tend to end up with is very concentrated, narrow portfolios. They don't take in diversification into account, and though that concentration does not lead to good risk-adjusted returns um, over the long term. So, my final conclusion on this is, it is better to rely on the broad academic research that is being conducted than these ad hoc, non-reviewed, in-sample research um, that are simply used uh, to promote individual products. We would rather rely on what we know from academic, peer-reviewed studies um, than ad hoc uh, methodologies that are used to promote individual studies. Okay, thank you, Eric. Okay, so as Eric said, it's always better to rely on broad academic research. Um, now we'll be opening up the floor to our viewers for some questions that you've been sending in. Um, and um, Eric, I'll just put them to you and see if you can answer some of our viewers' um, concerns or questions. And if you still ha haven't sent in a question, please do so to webinar at scientificbeta.com and we will um, try and respond to you before the end of the webinar. So let's see what we have here. It says the portfolio method complicates multi-factor portfolio construction compared to bottom-up approaches, uh, which build a multi-factor portfolio all in a single pass. 
So um, what do you say to that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is something that we hear um, so often. If you use a bottom-up approach, you can collect all the data and you can do everything at um, all at once mm -hmm. in, uh, in one simple pass. Well, the problem is you've got so much data that you, you're not sure if, um, if, you can, if you can rely on it. So it leads, it actually it's quite the opposite. It leads to out of sample, a lack of out of sample robustness. Now the idea of the top-down approach is that, um, yes, you are building single factor portfolios which you can then combine, but the reason you're building these single factor portfolios is to improve um, the efficiency of the portfolio, is to diversify away that stock risk. So you actually get a tremendous benefit um, from creating single factor portfolios um, that you don't get um, by using a single pass, um, if you like. So first of all, is it helps you um, diversify away stock risk, number one. So there is a, a benefit uh, to this. And secondly, um, the top-down approach also allows you a great deal more flexibility in terms of allocating um, to different factors as well. So I don't know, some people may think that's more complicated, but I would rather build a factor portfolio that is more robust out of sample than try and put everything together, put all these noisy signals together, and then end up with a portfolio that completely lacks um, robustness. So you do actually get tremendous benefit from building the portfolios in this top-down approach. Okay, great. Well, um, and I've there's actually one more point, if I could add to that as well, do, do. is that when it comes to performance attribution, mm -hmm. um, when you build portfolios in a top-down um, approach, you can then um, unravel those portfolios and you can understand exactly what is happening at the individual portfolio levels, where the performance is coming from. Mm -hmm. Is it coming from the factor? Is it coming through diversification? It allows you much greater tractability, granularity in terms of understanding. If you use this black box approach where you just throw everything together mm -hmm. to try to unravel that information then becomes pretty uh, difficult as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Eric. I think that's all. those are all the questions we have time for today. But um, I'd like to thank you for coming in, as always, and uh, sharing your insights. Thank you very much, Nami. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes today's webinar on a critical analysis of bottom-up bottom multi-factor portfolio construction. Um, we hope you found it interesting. We recently penned an article on the merits of a top-down approach to multi-factor investing in the latest Scientific Beta newsletter. Um, that's available on our website at www.scientificbeta.com and we will send you the link to access it where you'll also be able to download the slides in the presentation. Um, if you have a question that was not answered or you still want to ask a question, please send it to us by email to webinar at scientificbeta.com. We will be sure to respond to you as soon as we can. And please remember to look for us on social media. We are on LinkedIn and our Twitter handle is at scientificbeta. And you can also find us by searching on YouTube for the Smart Beta Solutions channel, um, where you can always rewatch any of our webinars. So as always, thank you for watching and goodbye.